Well, I want to say uh, welcome again. Welcome to Cross Community Church. We really are glad that you're here. And, and what that looks like for us, we're not terribly concerned about uh, where you've been in your past or what, what you've done, but we're really uh, excited about hopefully uh, encouraging you to follow after Jesus Christ. Our hope here is to lead all people to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus. And so that means that if you're far from him right now, you're not a follower of Jesus at all, uh, we're going to encourage you to take that step and follow him today. Uh, if you've been a believer for uh, decades even, uh, our encouragement is that you would continue to, to seek after him more and more. Now, normally we do things inside of a series. This is one of those rare weeks that we're just doing a standalone sermon. And so uh, today I, what I want to talk to you about is, is really what it looks like and how we should relate to God. Um, what we think about when we think of God really, really matters. I, I don't know about you, but when I was a little kid, uh, there were times in elementary school where we would sit around on the playground and we would debate the various punishments that God would dole out for the various cuss words that we might have said or not said, right? And so we would kind of rank them in order like, oh, that's the big one and this is the smaller one. And so, you know, if, if you say that cuss word, you might just get like a cold at this one. You're totally getting the flu, you know? And so we thought that God would dole out these punishments uh, when it came to stepping on a Bible Man, that might be a lightning bolt from heaven, like life's over for you. If you took the Lord's name in vain, uh, it's straight to, to hell with the devil. I mean, it was like we had this system. Uh, and what that reveals is that as a young boy, my understanding of God was like, he's the guy who doles out punishment, right? He's the God who, if you get out of line, he's going to let you have it. And it, it, with that perspective of who God uh, is or, or was, it was a faulty perspective, uh, I wasn't all that inclined, inclined to be like, you know what, I think I'm going to go pray, spend some time with God. Like, that'll be fun. I'm like, no, he's the guy that punishes us when we get out of line. And so I wasn't all that eager uh, to spend time with him. Again, what you think of when you envision God, who you believe God to be, how you believe he ultimately responds, it, it really affects things. I don't know if you remember back 2007, there was a book that spent 70-something weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. It was a book known as The Shack. And the reason it was so uh, popular and even controversial was because it presented a different view of God than many of us ha have had before. And so I'll, I'll be honest with you, it wasn't a particularly good uh, description of who God is or how he works, but here's, here's what it did. Um, God the Father uh, was a black woman portrayed as a black woman who was kind of this grandmotherly, tender, caring uh, figure in this guy's life. And so he goes to this shack, if you will, to, to grieve the loss of his daughter who had passed away. And God appears in the form of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, beginning with this black, caring, comforting, grandmotherly type figure that he called Papa. He begins to work through and process his grief. Jesus was a Jewish carpenter, wore a tool belt of of course he did, right? And they would take walks on the lake together. The Holy Spirit was uh, an Asian woman who liked to garden and bear fruit, right? And so uh, for many people, it was like, wow, I've never thought of God that way before. And it really helped me realize that he's a personal God. And then if you're like more of a um, like to say things about God that the Bible would say and not maybe speculate, you're like, well, I'm not sure that's the right reference to the Trinity. And listen, I'm not here to uh, commend the shack to you. It was an imperfect book, as, as any of them are. Uh, but today, what I would like to do for you is to begin to present uh, a perspective or uh, one of the ways that we should understand God. And I'm not going to do it from my own uh, thoughts or the book I'm going to write, but instead, I'm just going to do it directly from the words of Scripture. And I want to challenge you in the way that you think about God, the image that comes to your mind when you think about Him, and ultimately how you would begin to relate toward God. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Uh, this is what's known as the Lord's Prayer. We get this presented also in Luke's gospel when the disciples, they were kind of pestering Jesus. Uh, they're wondering about prayer. And they're like, hey, Jesus, could you teach us about prayer? Because it's challenging. It's a little difficult. You know, God doesn't speak back audibly. How are we supposed to pray? And Jesus teaches them there in Luke 11. He teaches us here in Matthew chapter 6 how we are to pray and ultimately to relate toward God, and it begins with this image that he gives us of God as our Father. 
Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 8 or verse 9, it says, Pray then in this way, our Father. When you think about God, you should not think about God as some distant, far off, uninvolved, unengaged character. But rather, when you think about God, you should think about a God who is personally involved with you. You belong to him, and he belongs to you. You are his child, and he is your father. The very beginning, to frame this whole thing, you should think about God like a father. Not this distant, powerful entity, not a a being out there that set the world in motion and then just kind of said, all right, you guys take it. But instead, as a father who cares for you. This is the dominant metaphor that we should see here in the Lord's Prayer, and it's going to carry us through the whole perspective. Now, I want to I want to kind of give you the the big story of the Bible in about 30 seconds and so it's not I'm not going to include all the details but if you don't know the the story of the Bible is that God created the world the heavens and the earth and everything in it he looked at it all and it was very good our relationship with our father who was in heaven was perfect we rightly related with him we walked we talked with God our relationships with one another or Adam and Eve's relationships with one another they were perfect they were married but it was still perfect the relationship the creation, all was very good. So God created the perfect world. And then sin entered that world when Adam and Eve disobeyed God. And it went badly very quickly. Pain and suffering and death and destruction and all the things that you and I know today entered the world because of sin. A lot of people look at God and they're like, why does God allow suffering? Listen, God created the perfect world. We are the ones who sinned and brought suffering into it with us. And so we live in a broken world. But God in his goodness looked down at the destruction that we face in this world, the pain and the brokenness, and he sent his son, Jesus Christ. Christ into that brokenness that we might be reconciled back to him. Because God's perfectly holy and we were utterly sinful, we were separated from God because of our sin. So God sends Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins, to pay the debt that we owe, that we could then once again be reconciled to God and have a relationship with him once again. But here's the problem. Having been alienated from God because of our sins, separated from him, we have to kind of relearn how are we supposed to relate to God and interact with him. And Jesus begins teaching us here. It's as our father. Um, A few years ago, I read a book by a man named Russell Moore. It's called Adopted for Life. I encourage you to read it. You'll probably have more kids uh, in your household not long thereafter because it's going to encourage you to do uh, for others what Jesus has done for you and adopt children. Um, In that book, he tells the story of Benjamin and Timothy. They adopted two sons from a Russian orphanage. And so uh, before the adoption was final, they got to go meet their new little boys. The Russian government was still finishing some paperwork, but they got to come and visit the orphanage for just a little while. And he talks about upon entering in the orphanage to get to meet these two new boys who were going to be their sons. Uh, He said he was struck by the stench, by the squalor, and by the silence. In an orphanage full of babies, row after row after row, all of the kids having cried and had no one respond, no one come and give them care, no one come to their bedside to comfort them, they had ultimately given up crying. So they found their boys laying there in the stench and the squalor in their own waste, completely silent in their cribs. They got to spend a few days with those boys, uh, Benjamin and Timothy, they named them. And uh, he got to say, hey, I'm, I'm your dad, and, you know, this is your mom, and we're going to be your family. And, of course, the boys are young, and they don't speak English, but they're doing their best to show them that they, they love them and that they, they care for these boys. And so they spent a few days with them, and then upon uh, having to leave, they put the boys back in their crib. They leave them in this dark, dirty place, and they have to go. And as they exited the orphanage, he heard what he described as the most horrifyingly beautiful thing he had ever heard. His boys were crying for their parents. For the first time in their life, they had somebody who cared. Somebody who they could count on to comfort them 
somebody who would come to their rescue when life was difficult and they were in distress. And those boys, after just a few short days, they began to cry out. And so he talks about how this is a picture of what God has done for us. We once, too, were alienated from God. We were orphans. But God, in his great love, in his mercy, has adopted us as his own children. And yet, there are difficulties in us learning how are we supposed to relate. Uh, Russell Moore talks about when they got to go back and take their boys home from the orphanage, and they brought them out of that dirty, dark, uh, difficult environment that they had lived in, and when they saw sunlight for the first time, And when they felt the wind howling across their ears and they heard the slam of a car door, the boys began to cry out and even reach back for the orphanage, longing for what felt like home, even though it was dirty and dark in a broken place. After they brought the boys to their house, he talked about how they used to hide food in their high chair because they hadn't come to learn um, that their father was going to provide for them. Not just that meal, but the next one and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. There was this time of transition from being an orphan to being one who is adopted. And for us who are believers in Jesus Christ, many of us are still in this time of transition, of learning to relate and to trust in God as our Father and all that that means for us. So today, I want to give you seven characteristics of God as our Father. The first one we've already talked about. He is our loving Father. And we are his children. Like, God is not the God who's just out to punish you. He's not the God who's, like, ready to kick you to the curb if you get out of line. Um, God is a God who saw us in all of our brokenness, in our sin, and our shame, just like those little boys who couldn't have gone and, and found a father, right? They were in a crib. They were too young for that. But their father came and found them in the same way. God came and he found us. The scriptures say that he chose us in him before the foundations of the earth. He adopted us as his own sons and daughters, when God saw you, strengths, weaknesses, successes, failures, your biggest disappointments, your best days, your worst days, he said, I want him to be my son. I want her to be my daughter. He has chosen us. We now belong to God. And he belongs to us. He is our father. And so Jesus, as he's teaching us how to relate to God, Relate to him as a loving father and you as his beloved children. The second thing that he points out that we should do, he says, pray then in this way, our father who is in heaven. Now, when you think about heaven and earth, uh, heaven is above, right? It's higher than we are. When you think about God, uh, he is above all of creation. God is a God who spoke all that we know and see into existence, And we can fix some stuff. We can maybe, you know, do a little creative work. God spoke and created all of the universe. He is all powerful. He's all knowing. God knows every single thing that's going on in the life of every single person at every single moment throughout history, all at the same time. See, he isn't just our loving father and we are his children. And God is a God who is sovereign. He's ruling and reigning over everything, over the entire earth. There's nothing that escapes his notice. There's nothing greater than God. He is up in heaven, and he has everything under control. I don't know what's going on in your life right now, but I promise you that God does. The doubt, the hidden depression, your financial difficulties, God knows it all. Your loving Father, he knows about it. And he is sovereign over every single piece of it. Listen, there's nothing you're ever going to face that's bigger than God. There's nothing you're ever going to go through that is bigger than your Father who is in heaven. And so he is our God and we are his children. He is sovereign over all. And because God has everything under control, let me just say this to you. You are free just to be his child. You don't have to fix everything. You don't have to take responsibility for everything. I don't know how it goes in your household, but my parents are, or my my kids are perfectly content to just let me be the dad, which means uh, they give zero stress about making sure the lawn gets mowed. They don't worry about whether or not we're going to have groceries in the house. That's on dad, or whether we have money in the bank account. They don't worry about whether the roof's going to leak. That's on me because I'm the dad and that's my job. Can I just tell you that your father in heaven is concerned about the things that concern you, and they are all well within his 
control. Your Father in heaven is going to take care of you, and you are free to rest in his sovereign power. He is our God. He is our Father, and we are his children. He belongs to us. We belong to him, and he is sovereign over all things. Jesus continued, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, here's even better news. Not only is God, this gracious God who chose us, who has made us his own, not only is he all-powerful and all-knowing, but what we see here in, in Jesus teaching us to pray, hallowed be your name, is we are being reminded of the goodness and of the worthiness of God, that he is ultimately worthy of worship. Isaiah 55, 9. Uh, the writer says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And we're never going to think anything better than God. We're never going to improve upon his ways. He is perfect in all of his ways. This God, who is our Father, who belongs to us and we belong to him, who is sovereign over all things, who knows every detail happening in your life right now, he is absolutely and fully Good. He is perfect in holiness, in his righteousness, in his justice, in his love for you, in his goodness towards you. God does not fail, not even a tiny bit. He is worthy of our worship. And he's above all things. And it should be a comfort to every one of us to know that this good, powerful God, he is ultimately for us. He loves us as a father. He's sovereign, and he is worthy of our worship of all glory and honor and praise. Jesus continues on. He teaches us to pray, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, aside from some Pesky junior high kids who might like to, you know, be contrarian at times. I've never met anyone that said, I, you know, I really don't want to go to heaven. As a matter of fact, when we think about heaven, we naturally think about paradise. We naturally think about the greatest place that there could possibly be. There's no more death and dying or suffering or pain or hurt or shame. Like we get to be in the presence of God where, where it is perfect peace and perfect love and perfect joy. And every one of us, for the most part, is going to say, yes, I want to go to heaven. I want to be there with God. And this prayer, it teaches us that this, this God who is our, our Father, whom we belong to and who belongs to us, who is sovereign, who is worthy of our worship, who is good, that ultimately for us, that we could trust in Him, in His will and in His ways. When you think about heaven, what we're praying here is, God, would you make that happen here? God, could I experience walking in your perfect will, your kingdom being present here on this earth? And listen, if God's perfect will being lived out in heaven is appealing to you, it should be appealing to you here as well, which means that we would begin to walk in obedience to that will, believing his thoughts and his ways are higher than ours, that God knows infinitely better than we do, and so we can trust this God. Even when it's difficult, even when the way that God would lead us, the things that we would read in his word, even when they don't make sense or they challenge what we think we know to be true or, or whatever, we can trust God because he has ultimately shown himself to be worthy of worship. He's sovereign. He's powerful. He's made us his own, and we can trust him. A, a few nights ago, we had one of those nights of lack of sleep in my household. Uh, my daughter had a cough, y'all. And y'all know how this can go in the middle of the night. The kid who's coughing, she can't go to sleep. She can't stay asleep. Uh, I got up two times. I, I laid beside her uh, for far longer than I wanted to, you know, long enough that I got really sore. My back hurt. And I'm like, I just need this child to go to sleep. You know, you know what I'm saying? Just, just me. Okay, well, it happens in my household. I, I want her to just, like, go to bed. And so I'm like, Piper, I'm going to get you a cough drop. And this is going to take care of everything. And so I did the fatherly thing. I got up. I went, got the cough drop for her. And I'm like, yes, you know, I'm going to get some rest here pretty soon. And I give her the cough drop. Y'all, there was a problem. The cough drop was the wrong flavor. So even though she had not been able to sleep 
She was coughing. She was miserable. I wasn't able to sleep. You know what she did not do? Take the cough drop. She, she sat there and she, she coughed and kept me up the rest of the night because it didn't taste right. Listen, sometimes the leadership of God in our lives is not going to feel right to us. And we're, we're not always going to see that on the other side of maybe what kind of tastes bad at the, on the front end or seems difficult on the front end, we're not always going to see that that's what's for our good. But because we trust that God is good, because we know that he's sovereign, his ways are higher, his thoughts are, we can trust God. Which means no matter what God asks us to do, we can know it's ultimately for our good. As a matter of fact, it's the best possible thing that we could do. So then Jesus, in teaching us, hey, how are we supposed to relate toward God? Relate to him, uh, re- relate to him as your, your father who loves you and you love him, who belongs to you and you belong to him. I don't know how it is with your kids, uh, but when my kids want something, they're not real good at waiting on their dad. As a matter of fact, it happens every single day, in particular with my youngest. I'm going to be sitting there content and comfortable in my recliner, and he's about to get all up in my business. Usually he runs and he jumps and he expects me just to catch him, right? And he's like, right here, right now, dad, you're going to listen to what I want. Let's go do this. Let's go do that. Dad, would you watch me do this? And Jesus teaches us we can approach God as our Father. Yes, He is perfect. He is holy. He is righteous. He is above. He's worthy of worship. But He's our Father. We belong to Him and He belongs to us. And as such, His ear is inclined toward our request. He cares about the things that concern us. He wants us to come to Him. And so Jesus does something a little bit unique here in teaching us how to relate toward God. Look what he says in verse 11. Give us our daily bread. You know, if I were writing this, I would probably be like, okay, after acknowledging how good God has already been to you, after acknowledging that you don't deserve anything from God, that all you brought to the table was sin, and he's so good and he's so worthy of worship, then maybe you could ask him to give you enough for today. But Jesus is like, no, 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 don't just set all that aside. He's your dad. And it's his job to provide for you. And so Jesus just says, pray to God, give us this day our daily bread. God, give us what you've ultimately promised. I don't know if you know this, but this is one of the promises of God in Scripture. One of the names we see of God in the Old Testament is Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. This is who God is, and this is what God does for us. Now, there is some prosperity nonsense out there that says that if you'll believe God for it, if you'll name it and claim it, then somehow God's going to give you the Ferrari that you've always wanted. And listen, I'm I'm just going to tell you, God's probably never going to give you a Ferrari but he's going to give you something better. God is going to take care of you. He's going to provide for your needs. He's going to provide for your emotional well-being. God is present with you, and he cares for you as a good father would. You know, when my my kids want something, again, they don't grovel unless it's like, you know, sweets and another soda or something, but they don't often grovel to me, right? They're, They're just like, hey, Dad, I'm hungry. And the expectation is that I, as their father, I'm going to provide for them. So Jesus doesn't teach us to grovel and apologize and try to, you know, somehow build God up to get into his favor. It's just ask him for what he's already told us he's going to give us. There are things in the Bible that God has promised us. And listen, you can take it to the bank that God is going to provide those things, um, but you don't get to write the list, right? You don't get to write God's promises for you. Uh, He's going to be good. He's going to provide for you. Now, there's something here that I want to point out to you. Jesus teaches us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. The way that God works is he doesn't write a big check to deposit in our trust fund at the beginning of our lives and then just leave us to go on our own. God is a daily God. He's a constant God. He wants us to walk with him, to seek provision from him each and every day. If you remember when the Israelites were led out of Egypt and they're wandering around in the desert, and a legitimate question when you're in the middle of a desert is, what are we going to eat out here? Well, God answered the question for them, and he provided for them. Every morning they would wake up, and there would be manna on the ground. And he said, hey, go get as much as you want to eat today. And so they would go, and they would gather that manna every single day. Um, And on the the day before the Sabbath, he's like, hey, you can gather enough for tomorrow, too, because the Sabbath was a day that he set aside for them to be able to rest. But if on any other day they tried to gather enough for tomorrow, you know what happened? It would spoil, and it would rot. 
and it would be worthless for the next day. But good news, there was manna on the ground the next day. And so they learned to know God as their provider, the, the daily provision that he wants to give us. Listen, God is not here just to be like, okay, you got your stuff, now leave me alone. You know, come back if you ever run out, but otherwise you're fine. God wants to walk with us through every single day. And this isn't just physical provision. And this is what we need for every single day. Day. One of the, the prayers that I pray, even before I, I would prepare and preach, is God, would you give to me what you would have me give to them? Because listen, I don't have it in myself. I don't have anything to give you that's beneficial in and of myself. So I'm praying, God, would you give to me what you would have me give to them? I do this in my marriage. I do this for my kids. God, would you provide what you want me to give them today? Because listen, I don't have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, all those things in and of myself. Those are fruit of the Spirit in my life. And so we come to God. Sure, for physical things, but we also come to him for spiritual nourishment. God, would you encourage me today? Would you help me? I've got the meeting. I'm going to have the conversation. God, I want to be a witness for you, and I need you today. And so it's this ongoing daily thing. One of the reasons we tell people here, devote yourself daily to God is because eating one day a week isn't enough. So we come to him to receive what we need for that day knowing that God's going to provide for us tomorrow. Russell Moore told the story about his boys. They came home and they would hide bits of food in their, in their high chair or wherever they could because they weren't quite sure, they weren't quite ready to trust that their father was going to provide for them. For us, our father in heaven is going to provide for us enough for that day. And then tomorrow and the next day and the next day, he's going to do the same. So God is our Father, and we are His children. We belong to Him, and He belongs to us. He is sovereign over every single thing. He knows every single bit of information. He knows the story that we don't know in full yet. He knows the outcomes that we're still looking forward to. He is sovereign over all. He is good. He's worthy of all glory and honor and praise, and so we can trust Him. He is our daily provider, but it goes on here as Jesus teaches us. In verse 12, he teaches us to pray and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Again, there's no groveling. There's no, oh God, I don't know if you can find it in your goodness to do one more time. Lord, I know I've blown it so many times and I just don't know how you could ever do this, but would you find it in your heart to forgive me again? No. Our God is a God who forgives. That's who he is. He is loving and gracious, and he is merciful, and he is kind. That's who God is. And so we don't have to wonder, is God going to forgive me? Man, if I cross that line one more time, is God going to give up and give me the boot? Now listen, your sin was fully atoned for on the cross. Your debt has been paid in full. Your sins of your past and your present and your future, God knew them all when Jesus Christ went to the cross, and he paid that debt in full. Man, when we come before God and we think about our failures of yesterday, listen, we, we shouldn't have this shameful response where we're like, oh, I got to hide, or maybe I need to clean myself up before I, I come to God. Now listen, our God is a God who freely forgives. More importantly in this prayer, in praying this line, is a reminder that we should forgive others as he has forgiven us, than even that God would, would forgive us. Listen, we are forgiven. It is done. It is finished. Our debt was settled on the cross. But we are reminded that for those of us who are prone to wonder, and that's all of us. When we fall back into that addiction, when we blow it again, when we swore that we never would, we can come to him with hope and with the knowledge that our God is a God who forgives. And then we turn to our fellow man, our spouse, our kid, coworker, and we forgive them in just the same way even though they blew it again, even though that they sinned against us one more time, even after all they've done, we forgive them because that's how God has forgiven us. We relate to God as our Father and we as His children, as a sovereign God who's powerful over every single thing. We relate to God as one who is good, who is worthy of our worship. We can trust Him. He's our provider. He's the one who freely forgives us of our sins. And then the, the final piece here. 
we relate to God as our deliverer. Again, this almost feels a little bit demanding of God, but we know that this is who God is and that's what he does for us. Verse 13, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God, I can't handle this. You know how I went yesterday. God, I've been battling this addiction for so many days or weeks or months or years. God, would you protect me from temptation today? You see, when, when we come to faith in Christ and Him as our Father, um, He's not here to make us strong, right? He wants to make us dependent. He doesn't want us to trust in ourselves. Like, you know, we show up, we get filled with the Holy Spirit, and suddenly we have like a Terminator suit and we don't need God anymore. That's not how this works. But every single day we come before God saying, listen, I know the weakness of my flesh apart from you, but I also know your power, your kingdom, your glory. Father, would you deliver me from that which tempts me? I think I had a, a, an understanding as a kid. Looked up at the preacher on the stage and be like, you know, he must really have his junk together. I can't wait till the day where I don't face temptation or struggle or I don't like blow it and lose my temper or any of that. Listen, I'm 40. I've been a believer for over 30 years of my life and I still face struggle and trial and temptation every single day. But in our heavenly father, as we relate to him, we have a deliverer. And there's no temptation that's bigger than your God. There's no sin that's bigger than your Savior. You can come to him. He's not going to lead you to failure, but instead he's going to lead you to a place of deliverance and a victory over that sin. And that is how we're supposed to relate toward God. He is our loving Father, and we are his children. He belongs to us, and we belong to him, and that ain't going to change, right? If we have trusted in Christ, we are saved. He's sovereign over every single thing, even the thing that concerns you right now. Now, he's got it under his control. He is a good, a worthy God, worthy of all glory and honor and praise, so you and I can trust him. He will provide for us. He will forgive us when we fail, and he will protect us as we go throughout this life. And so what that does is that frees us up to live lives enjoying God as his children. Sometimes we're going to be tempted to reach back for the things of the orphanage. We're going to return to those old patterns, those old ways of thinking. We're to try to be self-sufficient. Jesus reminds us, hold on, hold on, wait. You have a father who cares for you. Here's how you relate to him. Here's how you walk with him. Would you bow with me today? Lord Jesus, we praise you for your overwhelming goodness to us. God, we praise you that we can't out sin your salvation. We praise you that, God, even though we're prone to wander and we go astray, that you're there to deliver us, to draw us back to yourself. God, we praise you for that picture of the shepherd who chases after the lost sheep and brings them home. God, we're thankful that we're your children, and I pray that we would no longer relate as slaves or out of fear, but instead we relate to you as our Father. Lord, may you have your way in us. Jesus name. Amen.